I'd like to do, uh, first of all, is um, maybe we can pray first and then ask the Lord to bless our time together. And then we will go through these. And I have some questions for folks that are on the call. Um, so let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the most precious message that you sent uh, to your servants in 1888 and times afterward. And we just pray that as we look at these um, great 10 great gospel truths that you will further enlighten our minds, help us to see the connections to, to you and the connections to how we should uh, live. And also um, just enlighten us as to what message you would have us give to our friends and neighbors, to our family members, how we can encourage each other in the church. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, just to curious here, how many um, of you participants here have been to every Friday night study so far? Anybody? I think I've been attending all of them in the past few months. That's wonderful. So we'll be relying on you. Uh, who was that that spoke? Let's see, that was? Silvio. Silvio, wonderful, Silvio. So um, as we go through these, let's just brief, let's quickly go through. And I want you to be thinking of a, a couple things. One, do you have one of these um, 10 great gospel truths that you especially resonate with and that has impacted you personally? So be thinking of that. Second question, um, are there two or three of these or can you, can you see if any of these are linked together with each other? So that's the second question. And then um, what I'll do is I'll, we'll keep scrolling down. And after this, I have the statement from testimonies to ministers about the most precious message. And we'll look at that. And then uh, a third question, and that is, are there other truths that were presented in 1888 that you see that that you don't see explicitly listed here, or you know other things that um, have impressed you about when you've studied the 1888 message? And um, you know, as we present the message, is there an expansion of some kind to these ten points that you think would uh, make sense? So that's kind of taking us into the future a little bit. So the first one, Christ is, well, I guess we could ask a fourth question, and maybe we should put it first. In your mind, do you have, um, could you come up with a two or three word summary of each paragraph? So feel free to speak up if something comes to you here. But I'll read the first one. Christ has already accomplished something for every human being. He died the second death for every man and thus elected all men to be saved. In that sense, it is true that he saved the world. Appreciating what Christ accomplished by his sacrifice, lukewarm Laodiceans will learn the meaning of faith and how to glory in the cross. So if you were going to summarize that in um, like a short title, two or three words, what would you, what would you say? I should open the comments in case somebody is. Uh... Two or three words for this paragraph is not easy. I have to admit. Uh, okay, three. Take three. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't how help about, much. <laughs> how about Christ saved all? It's probably as good as it gets. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, you probably see the chat if I have it up there, don't you? No, you don't. Okay. By his uplifted cross and ongoing priestly ministry, Christ is drawing all men to repentance. His gracious love is so strong and persistent that the sinner must resist it in order to be lost. How about that? What would you say to that? Maybe 
Resist easy not to be saved. Easy to be saved. Okay. That's four words, but close enough. I mean, count the letters, I guess that'll be the <laughs> same size. Now, do you see a link between the first two? How would you describe that? Predestined to be saved. Okay. You see the, the word all is repeated in both of those. The sacrifice is effective for all. And then there's, as a consequence, there's a drawing of all that, that follows on the heels of that objective. So God, God accomplished the objective fact. He's drawing us to the subjective experience. And then uh, number three, it follows that it is actually easy to be saved and hard to be lost if one understands and believes how good the good news is. The only difficult thing is learning how to believe the gospel. Jesus taught this truth. So um, how about that one? We, we wouldn't want to say only believe, right? <laughs> believe is key, yes. What's that? I, I, I was thinking believe is key, but yeah, only believe is uh, two words. Yeah. Right, but you know, only believe has been used um, to denigrate actually what actual belief is. So I think uh, the author here says, or who wrote this says, if one understands and believes how good the good news is, the only difficult thing is learning how to believe. Is it difficult to learn how to believe? What makes it difficult if I it is difficult? Yeah, what makes it difficult is that we want to be in control. We want to be on the driver's seat. And we have a hard time letting somebody else be, I mean, Jesus be on the driver's seat. I think that's the main difficulty. So one word for that would be what? Submission? Yeah, or yeah, giving up on ourselves. That's the hard part. And really, fundamentally, that's the, that's the nature of the sin problem. So... Uh, Don or Rosalind or both said false teachings have infected the world about believing. Right. So there's this forensic only gos uh, gospel where, you know, just believe that he did this for you and everything's fine. Uh, you'll, you'll be saved. But under believing what he did, what he accomplished by his sacrifice is so important. What, what did he accomplish by his sacrifice? And we will see that later on uh, in our going th in going through these. So what he accomplished and then what he's doing, that's another thing that's so important. What is he doing? Okay, so the fourth one. Um, let's see. Let's anybody want to read that for us? Any volunteers? Okay. Yeah. Fourth paragraph. Right here. You want to read that? I think, I think she froze. I'll read it for you. Go ahead. It looks like she froze. Are you okay, Vivian? Uh, he, no. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm fine. Can you read that for him? Okay, Christ is a good shepherd who is seeking his lost sheep. Even though he have not sold him, a uh, misunderstanding of God's character causes us to think he is trying to hide from us. There is no parable of a lost sheep that must keep and find it shepherd. So if you were to summarize this one, this one's pretty easy. We could just call it what? God's... And He's our seeking savior. He's always reaching for us. The seeking savior. Now that's different from the world's conception of God, isn't it? Yes. 
does the world believe about God? Mm. God the song that was recently popular. I don't know if you remember it. God is watching us from a distance. Anybody remember that song? Mm. Yeah. But no, God is coming very close. So he's seeking after us. So in all of this, as we look at the first three paragraphs, then as they apply to us, or as God is trying to encourage us to believe, it's not like he just lays out the evidence and says, okay, you know, go ahead and believe this. He's actually seeking us. He's continuing to try to win us. Any other thoughts on that? He, he, the first step was done by him, not us. He is the one that initiates everything. Exactly. And that's, that's the thing that we have a hard time with because we want to be self-actualizing, right? Humanity. It's the sin problem. Very good. Okay, can I have another volunteer to read the next paragraph? I'll go ahead and highlight it here. Go ahead, Juan. You're there. In seeking us, Christ came all the way to where we are, taking up on himself the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Thus, he is a savior nigh at hand, not afar off. He is the savior of all men, even the chief of sinners. But sinners have the freedom to refuse him and reject him. Okay, thank you. So how would you summarize this in one you know, idea? Two or three words. No, no matter what, how lost the person is, he will always will try to reach for it. Mm. How about nearness of our Savior? The nearness, yeah, nearness of Jesus or Christ is near. And okay. just, yeah. he became not, like us. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. He became like us. Became like us. Very good. Yes. I think love oh. is there. It's the only word for that, love. Love, okay. Well, what amazing love that is for God to take the likeness of sinful flesh. Um, I don't think we have a conception of how painful that was or, or is. Uh, the, we're told the cross is but a, a dim reflection of the pain that sin from, from its very inception has caused to the heart of God. And... Um, taking the actual nature or the flesh of man that needed redeeming, I'm sure was a painful experience for Christ. But when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, them sin in the flesh, um, that's really a promise. And we'll see actually in the next paragraph, the implications of that. So let's look at that next paragraph. Can I have another volunteer to read this one? The new covenant is God's one-way promise to write his law in our hearts and to give us everlasting salvation as a free gift in Christ. The old covenant is the vain promise of the people to obey and gives birth to bondage. The spiritual failures of many sincere people are the result of being taught old covenant ideas, especially in childhood and youth. The new covenant truth was an essential element of the 1888 message. And even today, there's a load of doubt and despair from many hearts, many happy hearts. Okay, what would you be your title of this paragraph? He came to freedom. Us. All right. Freedom in Christ. Yes. Has anyone here a promise to obey? No, never. 
<laughs> yes, <Tom. laughs> experience the failure of that. Yes. What, what a wonderful uh, thought that God has promised to write his law in our hearts. You know, he promised that to his people, Israel. Not all of them grasped that and they struggled along. But we know that when Christ came, he was completely surrendered and the law was written on his heart and he was our second Adam. So we can claim that identity as ours. Okay, and then actually more explicitly, this is this ties, I think, um, this condemned sin in the flesh, it's repeated again. So you see the link, uh, Christ came um, to die the death for all men. And the law, of course, the law of sin and death demands death if we're separated from, from God. Christ suffered that. And in the process, he not only condemned sin in the flesh, he took it all the way to the cross. So in his life, he did it, and also in his death, he culminated that process. Um, our Savior condemned sin in the flesh, conquering the problem for the human race. He forever outlawed sin in the vast universe of God by defeating it in its last layer, our fallen sinful human flesh. Because of him, I think that's a typo, we should, I can, maybe I can correct that. Because of him, there is now no reason for any human being to go on living under the frightful dominion of sin. Sinful addictions lose their grip if one has the faith of Jesus. What would you call that paragraph if you had to put a short title on it? Faith brings freedom from sin. Okay, our, our titles are getting longer. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're making us work really hard tonight. Three, letter, three words is really tough, I'm telling you. Faith is freedom. How about that? Or um, That's a good one. That's very good. Yeah. All right. All right, we have three more here. Can I have a volunteer to read this one? A higher motivation becomes realized in the close of time that has prevailed in the church in past ages. A concern for Christ that he receives his reward and find his rest in the final eradication of sin. All egocentric motivation based merely on fear of hell or hope of reward is less effective. The higher motivation is symbolized in the climax of scripture, the bride of Christ making herself ready. So maybe what jumps out at me here, if you want a short title, is a higher motivation, right? Mm. Now, a motivation that's completely selfless has anybody arrived there yet i still struggle if i look in my heart what motivation what vote what motivates me to experience the faith of jesus or the righteousness of christ you know when when we really appreciate what he has done i do like to pray that prayer that he will receive reward But our egos are still here in this world, unfortunately. And so we have other motivate. We have mixed motivations at times. And maybe that's why this hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, are we all in for the one who is all in for us? Any other thoughts on that? Do you see that? Thinking to any other of these truths here? I would say uh, love motivates as a title. 
love motivates very good so we had love up here right demonstrated first two and in seeking us of course they're all actually all of them are demonstrations of god's love aren't they very good all right do we have a volunteer for the next one I'll read it. Good. The Bible so clearly teaches that righteousness is by faith. Therefore, the only element that God's people need in order to prepare for the second coming of Christ is genuine faith. The message the world needs to hear is the truth of righteousness by faith in the light of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the third angel's message in verity. Faith is understood in its true biblical sense a heart appreciation of the agape of Christ. Yes. It sounds a lot like the previous one in terms of if we were to say love motivates or a higher motivation. Um, but this is a little different talking about what righteousness by faith is. What is genuine faith? the third angel's message in Verity. So this brings it a little more specifically home to us. How do we get a heart appreciation of the agape of Christ? How do we get that? Uh, having a full understanding of what he did at the cross for us. Okay, under, a full understanding. Maybe a how do we get empathy though? I mean, do we, how do we suffer as Christ suffered or enter into his suffering? Uh, yeah. That's a gift too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is, it's a gift. I yeah. think beholding him is what makes us have empathy on him because as we look up to him, we look at how he lived, how he died, this is this is how uh, we are get we are you know it says that by beholding we become changed. So if we look up to him, then that's how we end up having the same feelings that he had. That's right. He's promised, and if we look to him, well, he will draw all to him. And draw the drawing is a drawing of love, and it is what draws or what compels us to go. Second uh, Corinthians five fourteen. The his love compels us, right? We're compelled by this. Very good, thank you. Okay, so the last one here, um, a unique thought, the 1888 message is especially precious because it joins together the true biblical idea of justification by faith with the unique idea of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. This is a Bible truth that the world is waiting to discover. It forms the essential element of truth that will yet lighten the earth with the glory of a final, fully developed presentation of the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14 and 18. Okay. Um, well, what would you title this one? Justification in the sanctuary. Very good. Okay. Now, how, how have we historically... You know, this, this paragraph says that this message is especially precious because it joins together these, these biblical ideas, justification by faith and the cleansing of the same. Um, if you, you know, as you were raised or you've studied or before you understood the 1888 message, how would you, would you see these things together? And if not, how were they disconnected? Maybe that's not a great question. We shouldn't concentrate on that too long, but if you separate justification by faith from the cleansing of the sanctu heavenly sanctuary, what happens? Then I think you just have faith without action, without consequences, without the works, right? Which is dead, like, like James said, says. Okay. So the heavenly sanctuary cleansing is tied to another cleansing. What cleansing is that? The heart. Cleansing of our hearts, right? Our, our own motivations. The heart of rock and the heart of... Um, 
sorry, the heart of stone and the heart of flesh. Heart of flesh. So if I believe that the, my heart needs to be cleansed, but I don't understand justification by faith, what do I have to do? Legalism. I have to work harder, right, legalism. Okay, so now I'm gonna open this up and ask all of you, any of you, is there one of these particularly that was an aha moment for you when you encountered this message? One of these, um, I guess I could shrink this down maybe a little bit, Let's see if we can get them all on here. I don't know, can you still read them if they're smaller? No. Can't read those? <laughs> Too small? All right. So any personal testimonies, how God has touched you with one or more of these? The thing that really puzzled me for me in many years is that it's this idea that it's easy to be saved and hard to be lost. This thing, you know, I had to spend a lot of time coming to terms that this is actually true. And if it wasn't true, then God would be evil. Can you unpack that a little bit? How, what, how would that make God evil if it was? Well, if it was difficult to be saved, then, you know, God would be evil. He would be making our life hard for no reason, but he has made our life easy. And we are striving. We're working really hard to make our lives hard. Mm. Okay. <laughs> we make it much harder than it should be. Exactly. That's the, that's the deception of sin, isn't it? Anybody read Pilgrim's Progress? Seen these other stories where, you know, maybe it was Pilgrim's Progress, or maybe it was a where this man's carrying this burden, and then someone comes along and offers a ride, and he, he keeps carrying the burden, even carrying him. And they say, "Well, why are you doing that?" So I'll carry this. You know, <laughs> we have our own part we want to do. Okay, anyone else? Uh, where any? particular part of the message that has really touched your life been an encouragement but i it's been a long time ago now but i remember when i first heard um that, that christ took on a humanity like mine that needed redeeming. You, you, your volume is a little low. I don't know if you can, can you try to get a little closer to the mic, maybe. I remember when, is that better? Yes. I remember when I first heard the 1888 message, and it was a message of Christ's humanity and how he took on a humanity um, that needed redeeming and, and how he... I had just gone through a very difficult time in my life. And I'll just, I'll just tell you, I had a nervous breakdown and, um, and, and the person who, it was Jerry Finneman who said, he actually said that if, if you have had a nervous breakdown, you will, you will have some idea of what Christ went through on the cross. Mm. And naturally I was ashamed at what I had put my family through, you know, that I, I had become such a mess. And, um, and I suddenly realized that Christ understood what, what I was going through. You know, mine was self-inflicted, of course, but, but um, I suddenly realized through this message that Jerry gave for three weeks, weekends in a row that I really had a savior who understood me. I had someone that I could, that I could call on and that I could, that I could trust. And I mean, it changed everything. As a matter of fact, I worked with the man who was the main cause of this and, a and I could, I, it took me a long time to be able to go back to work. Um, I, I was on disability. It was bad. And um, when I got back to work, he said to me, you've changed. 
And I wish I could have told him why. But I, I just, I still was having a difficult time facing him at that point. Thank you for sharing that. That's, you know, if, if any of us have been, well, most of us, are, we all come to points where God, I think, allows us to be tested in that kind of way so that we can be drawn to throw ourselves entirely on his mercy and his care. And it's a, it's a real um, blessing to, to have that experience. Um, <clears throat> anyone else have a? Um, yes, um, for me, one of the experiences that, um, is a moment by moment, you know, that um, things that I screwed up I have two teenage. Well, we have two teenagers, and um, and it's quite of uh, challenging what uh, we we seen that now, and um, and it's moment by moment, and and trying to um, to seek uh, looking looking more for my kids, and also seeing and trying to explain them um, how important it is to be um, in, in that communication with Christ in prayers, in fasting, and depending on him all the time. And, and I've been learning that more. And waiting on him and keep praying for my kids so that way they becoming more understanding. Um, but it's because of, of, of the love that, that I could see in Christ all the time for me and waiting on me and, and see in so many things that I could have done before and he keep looking for me. Mm. And it's, it is just um, so beautiful all the time that, that how, how many times I screwed up, you know, in, in screaming and being legalistic and trying to um, change my husband, change my kids. <clears throat> and, um, and just one day at a time, and looking for his, uh, for his, for his mercy more every day, the way that he's doing it for me, doing I'm trying to do it with my kids, um, but in not trying in my own. If it's trying to see of what he did, and then that's when, like, make me willing to be willing. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's the part that is more. Um, um, Every day, I go like, huh. <laughs> yeah, how did that go? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I, I resonate with just about everything you said there. And it's interesting, you know, we're very idealistic when we have children. We're going to mm -hmm. do better than our parents did with us. Mm -hmm. we, we're exposed to the gospel, and we're going to apply these principles. And uh, we think we understand the gospel. And then we get to apply it in our families, and and um, but I, I really appreciate your what you emphasize there. It's just like God has done for us. Christ has accomplished something for us already. He's ministering, drawing us. He will. He's, he'll write that law in our hearts such that then we can use those same uh, principles as we uh, draw. We want our children drawn as well, and it's what we want them to see is the preciousness of the gospel. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Last chance. All right. I'm going to scroll on down here. 
and we're going to go to the next page of this. And this uh, hasn't been tidied up yet. I just copied and pasted this into a document from Testimonies to Ministers. You're familiar with this famous um, quotation. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. The message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of what? The whole world. The whole world. So we see that first principle there. It presented justification by faith in the surety. What is a surety? Any, we have any attorneys on here? Or paralegals or people who know what the word means? What is a surety? Something like a gauge, like something that you, um, it's like, you know, when, uh, when Joseph's brothers went to Egypt and uh, one of the brothers has to, had to stay there as a surety, like a guarantee that they were going to come back. Okay. In truth. A guarantee in truth. In truth. To sure that something's happened. So, you know, you've heard that Christ is our substitute, right? Jesus is our and we think of that in terms of him experiencing the, the consequences of sin yeah, as our behalf. Or, um, and a lot of evangelicals and even Adventists, I think, we think of him apart from us as we think of that as his, our substitute. But Ellen White, I think, elsewhere says he's not only our substitute, he's our surety. And that, I think, is the, maybe the universal aspect. Uh, he's the guarantee for how many? Eternity. For all. For all. Yeah, for all. It's, um, I like that the quote in Acts of the Apostles where Ellen White is writing about what Jesus told his disciples. And she says, in essence, that he told them that they were the executors of his will. And in his will, he had bequeathed to the world eternal life. So in Christ, eternal life is guaranteed. Amen. Amen. So uh, again, I think another of these concepts we can see in what Ellen White is describing when she says this message, this message, she says, here's, here's the things that presented, right? And she listed the uplifted savior, sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And then um, she even home further by using this word surety, which I think expands. You know, we, I, I like to tell people that the understanding of righteousness by faith uh, as it is in Christ, there are key parts in my mind. One is the humanity of Christ, that he took our fallen nature. The other, another one is um, the in Christ thief, and that is that Christ was representing all of humanity. And then, uh, the, th the third one, let's see, what was the first one I just said? <laughs> I'll make sure I don't repeat. Anyway, yeah, the idea of a universal aspect, the, the um, humanity of Christ and the in Christ motif. And if you're missing any one of those three, the other two don't really make sense. I don't know if that makes sense to anyone, but that's how I kind of conceptualize it. So she goes on, she says, it invited the people to what? Receive the righteousness. So here we see, I don't know if you recall those 10 points. It was leading us through this process. So we have what Christ has done for all. And then we have the response. It's an invitation. It's not a force. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to receive. If we've been bequeathed, we've been, we have a, a Christ in his will. He gifted us with his righteousness. And the invitation of the gospel is to receive the righteousness of Christ. So, 
and notice what comes first, receiving the righteousness of Christ, which is then made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Now, I'll ask a question. Can we receive Christ, or sorry, can we receive his righteousness without receiving him? That is, does he say, here's my righteousness, and he hands it to us, says, okay, take my righteousness. I think we receive his righteousness through his indwelling in our lives, so it cannot be, the two cannot be separated. Yes. I mean, the obvious answer to that is, no, you cannot receive his righteousness without receiving him. But I can tell you that there are a lot of people who ask the question, I know a lot of good people who don't believe in Christ. Why won't they be in heaven? And the, the truth is, is that you need a savior, you know, and the time will come when, when there'll be a sorting of, you know, the, the sheep and the goats. But it's a valid question for young people these days because of, you know, because of the, the, the mood towards Christianity. How would you answer that question then in the context of the 1888 message? What is, what happens to the good, well, we don't know what happens to the good people, but are they all going to be lost because they haven't um, expressed? I, I can't answer that question. I don't know who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. You know, well, but, I mean, I do, Bible. but I have, I have tried to answer this question with young people. I think, I think the Bible is very clear that there is no one righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. So um, our righteousness has filthy rags. So, so I know we always use the term, uh, somebody was a good person when, like when they die or something, you know, or, or we relate to somebody as a good person, but it is just, uh, I guess it's just a kind of uh, loose talk because uh, from the biblical perspective, only, only God is good. And, uh, and I think Christ uh, confirmed that when he said to the, um, to the rich young ruler, you know, why call me good? Only God is good. So, so we have to help people to recognize that, uh, that we are sinners. You know, we are altogether sinful and, uh, and, and, and there's no good in us, but we are sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Yes, that's, that could be challenging. You know, we were just um, in South Lake Tahoe, actually on the Nevada side of the border for a conference. And on Sabbath afternoon, we went out door to door and the idea was we, we would ask people if they would like us to pray for them for something. And then um, we would offer the card, you know, here's some things that the Seventh-day Adventist Church locally offers, you know, if you'd like to be interested. But um, because of time, um, my wife, Patty, went to the door and I was in the car moving so we could get th keep things going. But almost uh, without exception, or maybe one exception, and a lot of the houses are empty because this is, you know, vacation homes and people are well off. But almost without exception, when she asked if there's, if they were out here, you know, we're offering to pray for people. Is there anything we can pray for you for? They would say, no, it's okay. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, it's another way of using the word. But it, the, the implication is we don't understand, as you said, our sin problem. We don't understand how bad off we are. And really, that's the Laodicean condition I think we need to recognize. And that's what I think she brings, starts to bring out next. The Laodicean message is actually part of this message that was brought. It started before, you know, the Laodicean message was being preached, and certainly Ellen White was bringing it out before 1888. But the real problem, and back to the beginning, you know, how do we get this? By beholding. Many had lost sight of Jesus. How do we lose sight of Jesus? Is he still there? By focusing on self. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, um, self is always in competition with God. And uh, um, we refuse to believe that we, we died when he died. And 
and it is this whole thing about covetousness. We, we, we feel like we, we could, um, you know, we don't need God. We could do what, you know, we could do what we need to do to get into heaven. And, uh, <laughs> and maybe, and maybe Christ has done some, some part of it, but now we have, we have to do the rest. Very good. Interestingly, she expands on that thought, losing sight of Jesus and the particular aspects of Jesus that needed, we needed to be looking at through this message, his divine person. So, um, interestingly, she didn't say his, his human person, but it's important that in his divinity, he took on humanity. But when we focus on the divinity that he brought to the, to the experience, I think that's the experience we need too. We need the indwelling of divinity in us through the Holy Spirit, his merits as opposed to merits, his changeless love for the human family. We call that agape, right? Changeless love uh, in contrast to human love, which is based on what, on the, that self, you know. Um, so this gives us an idea of, what we were to grow out of but even more than that wow do we really believe this all power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent if we know this if we believe this um what does it take to sin he has all power dispensing the gifts to us. He's given us his righteousness to the helpless human agent. What makes us sin? Unbelief. Unbelief, yes. That what do we not believe? That we're helpless, one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we may not believe that he has all power that he's mm -hmm. dispensing the gift. And we don't believe that he gives us rich gifts. That's right. So I, I think it's uh, we, we tend to believe the risk is that we believe this lie that uh, we are not we are only going to stop sinning uh, after the second coming. We, we're going to go on sinning all the way to the second coming. I think this this doctrinal belief is really what is hurting a lot of people. It's a bit oh, sorry. Yeah, I think it's also one of those things where we 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 have this feeling that this you know this is too good to be true. What do you mean? There's nothing for me to do as far as my salvation. What do you mean he did everything? And so we have this thing where we feel like we have to make some contribution at least uh, to our salvation. So 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 it's hard for us to believe that he has done it all for us, and we just have to respond in belief. Well, helpless means we're helpless. We're, we can't do it ourselves, right? That is humbling, humbling about this message. But, you know, I think as the world, you look at the way the world's going, um, look at the problems that humanity has, both individually and corporately, and look at the measures that are being taken to try and counteract the development of evil. In fact, this was going on in the 1888 era. Uh, God commanded this message to be given to the world, third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, attended by the outpouring of the spirit in a large measure. Um, so this I think helps, uh, and we can, we, we can certainly read the rest of this. Uh, the efficacy of the blood of Christ was to be presented to the people with freshness and power, that with faith they might lay hold on his merits. Um, when we talk to the people in the, in the world who don't know this message and say there's a mass shooting, what caused the mass shooting? And what's the solution? or a, the drug epidemic, or, you know, um, the climate is changing, or, 
you know, there's another pandemic. And I mean, do you see the, there's a link here between this message and religious liberty. In fact, in that era, in the 1880 era, there was a real decline in morals in the country and people were trying to say, how do we fix this problem? And what did they come up with? Prohibitionism, I think. For alcohol, Prohibition. for example. Yeah, which of course we supported. But what else? The Blair Bill. The yes. Blair Bill, exactly. The, 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 if we could band together and require people to attend church or at least not work, um, then we would no longer be helpless. <laughs> we can do something. So the, the whole idea of um, banding society together to require people to do something in order to restore morality or to save humanity, be it from climate, virus, or anything, the idea of demanding you know, forcing people to do things. Um, I don't know if you can see that that is, um, it's maybe the flip side of the gospel coin, you know? So religious liberty, God, God provides everything for us. He gives it freely to us in Christ. He draws us, he, he shows us who he is to draw us. And then it's our choice. He doesn't force himself on us in, in any way, even to save us. So I guess we're just got a few minutes left here, but to the last question I wanted to ask, or any other thoughts that you might have, um, are there other aspects uh, as you've studied the 1888 era, the Minneapolis message, the history, um, I mentioned religious liberty, um, are there other biblical spirit of prophecy, Jones and Wagner ideas that you see in that message um, that may be a little broader or maybe said a little differently than the 10 great gospel truths. I think those are great. Um, someone was explaining to us that, you know, Elder Wheland, Elder um, Robert Wheland, I think was uh, very involved in putting those together. And part of the did that was countering this idea of a forensic only justification. So Desmond Ford were promoting this idea um, that denigrating the work of Christ in the sanctuary, uh, again, you know, there's, you're not gonna have sinless living before Christ come. Of course, we're told we're not gonna focus on ourselves because in ourselves, we are sinful. So you have to be looking at Christ to have that experience. But, um, so that was the context in which those 10 points were, were written. So as you look at today, are there other aspects of the 1888 message that have been either implied there or that you've seen elsewhere that are, have uh, really struck you as, as something important? And somebody asked a question here, Michael did, uh, are the rich gifts complete gifts? Hmm. As you know, some people have a problem with Christ being presented as a complete savior. But the, you know, the, the, que the question is one that, you know, makes you go there. Is he, is he a complete savior? Does he give, if he's a complete savior, does he give complete gifts? Or is there something missing in them? Something we have to do or add to it. Well, we're told that this message was to lay the glory of man in a certain place. Do you remember where that was? Dust. In the dust, yes. Yeah. But but it is our that's our human nature. We want to take, you know, we want some credit. Ellen White even said there was danger in putting merit on faith. So we start mm -hmm. to own the faith. We say, well, that was my faith. I, I believe. <laughs> well, where did the faith come from? Oh. Yeah. the author and finisher of faith yeah. but we are saved by the faith of jesus it says right amen right 
So the faith of Jesus is mentioned in those 10 great gospel truths, but maybe um, I think more recently we've felt the desire to really um, maybe even yeah. emphasize uh, on its own, right? What is exploring what is the faith of Jesus? What does it mean? Very good. Okay, anyone else? Well, uh, one of the one of the cores, I think, of the 1888 message is that Wagner and Jones would back up everything they say <clears throat> or said with with scripture. You know, they weren't relying on anything else other than God's word. That had what been had been showing them. That is what they desired to share. They didn't want to debate about it. And, you know, even at the 1888 conference, you know, rather than debating, they stood up and they took turns quoting scripture <coughs> to the audience because that was their message. Their message was to bring God's people back, back to where they needed to be, back out of legalism, back focusing on God's word. And, um, uh, and then when we see the way of the Southern state in Revelation 3, that comes back at us is, you know, if we've got a problem, that problem is, is self because we think we're okay. And, you know, someone mentioned earlier that, you know, that uh, it seemed too good to be true. But there's, there's no limits to God's giving as we've, we've seen here in this paragraph we've been looking at. And... You know, we, he's even given us the faith as part of that gift, not an offer, but a gift of salvation. And so the faith of Jesus is, is not something that we have to earn. We just have to believe that he's done it, that he's given it to us. And when we can get to that point, then we want to do nothing but give our all to God, mind, body, and spirit. And that's what he wants. That's what he wants when he wants us with us forever. So it just, to me, it just all fits together in a beautiful, you know, puzzle. That you know, he's given us the puzzle. What strikes me as you describe what Jones and Wagner were doing, yes. they were actually demonstrating the faith of Jesus. Mm -hmm. They were the word of God to do what it said <laughs> to. So they were using the word as the vehicle for the message. So that idea of the faith is, is, is believing that God's word, he will do what he said, that his word has the power to do what he said. I think that's another maybe aspect of the message. So yes, thank you. Anyone else? I think this passage that says, you know, this person asking Jesus for a miracle and he says, please, Jesus asked him, do you believe? And he said, yes, I believe. Please help my unbelief. So I kind of believe, but... No, so I think this statement really proves that we cannot boast in our faith, you know, even our faith, please help my unbelief, even our faith comes from, from him. Uh, but back to your question regarding the 1888 message, there's a couple of principles that I, I really have a hard time to get through to people. I get a lot of pushback for those. One of them is corporate repentance. And uh, you can prove it with Daniel, it's, it's, it's pretty evident, but people just do not accept that. And the second thing is that we should care more, like we read it tonight, we should care more about Jesus' restor Jesus's character restoration. Like um, he was accused, he was accused of all sorts of things by Satan. And our goal here on earth is not for us to be saved or for us not to be lost, but our goal is to restore his reputation that has been tarnished by Satan. And when this people may kind of understand, although there's a little bit of pushback because we always focus on ourselves, but corporate repentance, really, I don't know how else to, to, to get it through to people. They, they just don't want to hear. Yeah, it's... You know, I think, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Chuck. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the big problems with, um, you know, corporate guilt, corporate repentance has to do with dealing with people in the West, in the Western mindset, because, you know, I, I come from Africa, and, and it makes more sense to me you know, understanding that corporate uh, guilt and corporate repentance. I remember Pastor Jack used to, Pastor Shakira used to talk about this a lot. You know, in, in the, if, if you're thinking, in the, in, you know, with a Western mindset, 
it's very hard to process, you know. Um, but the Bible was written from a Middle Eastern, you know, uh, 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 mindset, and so, and so you have to literally shift, you know, and, and that is not easy for people to do. But um, but I think with um, you know because because it's, I mean the scripture is there to support it. It's, it's it's quite clear from the Bible, but it's very hard coming from a Western, you know, mindset to to see it and to really appreciate it. Yes, that's one of the three legs of the stool. The the in Christ, in Adam, in Christ, those, are those that representative nature of humanity and of Christ taking humanity is so key to understanding the corporate aspect. And I think, you know, if we're honest, even in the Western society, I, I speak of this as a parent and a son. <laughs> uh, if we're honest, we see the sin problem we have manifested in certain ways that came from our parents, from their parents, all the way back to Adam. And we can see it passed on to our children. And, and so we can see the corporate aspect of the sin problem that shouldn't be too difficult, right? Um, so as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You know, through one man, death passed to all men. We see sin causing that death, like ex that death experience and pays its wages in death. And, um, but we're told in Romans 5 that much more uh, comes through Christ in the same corporate way. But we can't, how do we even grasp what Christ has done for all for us all in humanity, this new identity, unless we see our corporate identity in Adam and we can repent for that in some fashion. And so that connects us to the past, you know, to our, our church fathers and, and all the way back. Um, I think some people are hung up on that because, you know, we don't want to maybe denigrate the church, but it's much broader than just the church, even though we certainly have much to repent for. You read what Ellen White says in the 1888 era, but put it in the context of all of humanity. But thank you. Yes, very good, Sylvia. Uh, yeah, yes, also um, in corporate <coughs> repentance, um, it, is, it is so deep and it's so beautiful when um, we could um, um, try to understand the part of that whatever a person do to me, I'm able to do the same thing to that person too. And, um, and we don't see ourselves as of sinners. We don't see mm -hmm. ourselves that we make a lot of mistakes. We don't see ourselves that I could do um, a bad stuff and say bad stuff about people. And, um, but yeah, in corporate repentance, we could see with, that, yes, I am that person. Yes, I do the same things that you do. And that's the part that, uh, that um, especially uh, leaders in the church is very hard for them to understand it. And even in any, 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 any kind of leader, uh, it's very hard for them understanding that the, the corporate, I'm, I'm, I'm them. I'm involved in the same what they do and I could do the same thing. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, anyone I'm else? Reminded, yeah, I'm reminded of, of texts like if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will hear their land. I mean, the Lord has always dealt with us, with his people as mm -hmm. a people. And I don't, I don't see much unusual about, he's called for corporate repentance before. And if the Jews had, um, hypothetically speaking, and maybe, maybe we shouldn't do this, but if the Jews had repented and accepted Christ as their savior and, and not crucified him, what would their repentance have looked like? It would have been very corporate in nature. Mm -hmm. And so this, I, I, sometimes I'm a little baffled why this is a difficult concept for people to grasp. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. 
Yeah, we're we're our, we're children of Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think we have the same um, weakness. You know, we're spiritual Israel. So yes, it, it, when Todd, when you asked earlier about about, um, I can't remember exactly what you asked, but I remember thinking to myself, one way I know about how to appreciate what Christ has done for me is to know that I am not even capable of taking the next breath were it not for the cross of Christ. It's a good Amen. prayer. Amen. Okay, well, it's 539. I think we've gone over our hour, but I'm, I've been blessed by the discussion here and the input of each one. I don't know what the next series of studies is. Hopefully there'll be something. Uh, but I, we're welcome for to have any ideas presented. You know, anything you'd like to, part of the Minneapolis era or message that we could look at again. I have uh, one. I would love to hear one on the faith of Jesus. Ah, okay. Maybe Juanita, you I can forward that. Maybe you can, Juanita, you can forward that on to Bob and see if that's uh, or the ecom see if that's good or. See if they want to arrange that. So yeah, exploring the faith of Jesus. I think that's that would be a worthwhile. We could probably get several months out of that, don't you think? Yeah, that would be a good topic. <laughs> okay. Well, very good. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up and close here. Um, some of you are probably in different time zones. <laughs> so, um, is anybody over? Uh, like, is it? Uh, in the middle of the night anywhere? Well, the sun has set here on the East Coast. Well, East Coast. I'm in Toronto, so it's not really the coast, but we're in the Eastern time zone. So, yeah, it's uh, it's dark now. Okay. Is anybody in Turkey or Africa or Russia or Ukraine? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... The world is really connected these days, speaking of corporate, and we can see the problems becoming more global. All right. Well, I will uh, close with prayer, if that's all right. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for Jesus who was who was sent to uh, save us from our sins. And we're thankful for this message, this most precious message that you sent and that we have it to study. And we pray that um, you will help our unbelief. We believe you're good. We believe that you have given every gift possible in Christ. Help our unbelief. And we pray that we thank you. We praise you for your promise to write your law in our hearts, and we expect that your word will do what it says. And we also claim the promise that we will contend the, with the one who contends with us, and you will save our children. We pray. Help us to so live this message that our children especially, but everyone around us, will be drawn to the uplifted Savior. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. All right. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.